So I would need to ask you a bit about Mr. Farage, yeah. because this comes up all the time when you talk to people about reform or you make videos or in reform and it always comes up. What's Nigel doing? Um, now, there's a certain section of um, sort of diehard tribal Tory people who seem to be harboring this, for me, seems like a, a, a pipe dream that he's going to join the Conservative Party and, and within Never. a few years be their leader and lead them Never. to a whole new renaissance in Parliament. Um, uh, from what Not he happening. actually says, um, that's absurd. At, at party conference, I was at party, the last party conference and, you know, he was laughing out loud at the, the idea. However, when he was in the jungle, he was specifically asked that and he was very non-committal and vague. He just said, who knows? Now, I've been told that that was a deliberate, he was sort of trolling the Tories by saying such a thing. So, again, can you tell me what you know, your thoughts and feelings on what Nigel's got in mind or what's going to happen with the whole Nigel aspect? I don't want to sidestep the question, but really it's Nigel you need to Fair interview enough. and ask him that question. Um, but my take on it is Nigel is a fantastic politician. He's a fantastic communicator. He's able to take very complex issues, distill them down into bite-sized chunks of information and convey them in a way that 90% of our political class can't. And so he is a terrific asset to any party that has him. I, I don't see him ever joining the Conservative Party, at least the Conservative Party as it is at the moment. I just can't see, not in a month of Sundays. There are fundamental problems with the Conservative Party that go beyond just the parliamentary. And the reason the parliamentary party is broken is because CCHQ is broken. The whole recruitment process is broken. They don't know how to recruit proper people into being proper conservatives into being MPs. So I just don't see that changing in a hurry. Um, and whether or not he joins Reform UK in a more active role, that remains to be seen. Nigel is like that very beautiful lady at the bar whom all the guys want to chat up but he's not going to say yes in a hurry to anyone. <laughs> right, fair enough, because at the moment he's honorary president. I believe that's his title, isn't it? Yeah. Honorary president. Yeah. So, of course... Uh, or president, I think. Or, or, yeah. or president, president, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah. you know, if, if he wanted to stand somewhere, of course Richard and the senior leadership team, will confirm this for me, would, would allow him to do that at sort of a, a, a oh, drop of a hat. Oh, we'd be delighted. Right. Of right. course, we'd be delighted, yeah. Um, so, um, so, well, so fingers crossed that he'll do that at, at this next election then, I guess. Yeah. Um, but if he doesn't, Bo, if he does, you know, great if he, Nigel joins us. But as I mentioned, there's something happening in the nation. It's happening anyway. If, if Reform UK is to succeed, it can't be about one man. It has to be about a movement. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. got to be about a depth and breadth of people who come together under a single plan, which is, in my view, seeing off the existential threat that the United Kingdom faces, making policies for our national interest, for the people's interest. That's how I see Reform UK's job. When people say, what is Reform UK? I say, this may sound daft to you, but our fundamental principle that differentiates us from the other parties is that we wish to make policies for the British national interest. And you'd think that's a given for the Conservatives and the Labour Party, but it ain't. Mm. You know, they're seeing everything through the prism of the EU the G7, the WHO, what they, the great and good with whom they rub shoulders at the World Economic Forum. You know, Starmer said he'd rather be in Davos than be in Westminster. That absolutely tells you where his mind is. What an um, incredible thing to say, really. I mean. An incredible thing to say. The man's not fit to be prime minister. Um, yeah, so one last thing on Nigel before I move on. I absolutely yeah. agree with you that uh, the, the movement, the party should be or is bigger than one man. Um, absolutely agree with you in principle. But once again, it's the, the, the psychology of your average voter, of your average person, your average human being, is that you can't help but put a lot of emphasis on the leader, one the person. man, the one yeah. person, the, the, great, the great, right? Um, yeah. The captain, the centre yeah. forward, the try scorer, the goal mm. kicker. Mm. You know, mm. you just want that guy. But let's just see what happens over the next few months, Bo. Okay. You know, okay. let's just see what happens. I, as, I, as I say, I think there are political sands shifting at a speed that people aren't appreciating. And 
that will in itself present itself to Nigel. It will become clearer and clearer to Nigel what's happening politically. And uh, I mean, he's very politically astute. It's not for me to, you know, second guess the way he sees the landscape. But mm. um, I, I'm sure he is looking very carefully at what's going on. OK, you mentioned uh, the WEF a moment ago. I'd like to switch yeah. over and ask you a couple of questions just about that. Uh, once again, uh, Mr. Tyus has been extremely clear. I had the privilege of interviewing him a while ago and I asked him straightforwardly your feelings on the WEF. Um, and he said, you know, unequivocally, we'll have no truck with them. I, I, I yeah. sort of almost got him basically to repeat it. He said, no, you know, we will not bend to them. We will not be their, their creature, their puppet in any way, shape or form. Not, not one tiny iota. Um, so I want to get your feelings on that and, you know, the feelings and the policy within the party on, uh, yeah. on, on WEF. So it's axiomatic, in my view, that big business should not be in bed with the leading politicians of the world. I think that's, an, that's a rule that should never be broken. And the vast majority of our parliamentary standards are set up to prevent big business from being able to influence government, right? You know, if MPs are paid cash to ask questions, they get deep disbarred. If MPs are lobbying, like Cameron was for Greensill, it's frowned upon. Had Cameron been in office then, he would have been driven out of it, and so on. Yet, with the World Economic Forum, somehow it's become legitimate for the richest people in the world to meet the most powerful political leaders in the world behind closed doors and rub shoulders with each other and exchange notes and make plans without anyone knowing what the hell they're up to. And we know they're doing deals. We know we're do they're doing deals because we have the evidence of it. For example, Nick Clegg left office and joined Facebook, now called Meta. Osborne left office and became a director of BlackRock, one of the biggest fund managers in the world. Um, David Cameron, we've talked about him, left office and became an advocate for Greensill, a company that then went bust, having taken hundreds of millions in loans from the government. Um, and yet he's still back in office. There is something sick at Davos. There's something sick about the World Economic Forum. It's, it's giving legitimacy to what we all know to be incredibly bad practice, if not illegitimate. The coming together of big money and big power, that's not a good recipe. That's an awful recipe for uh, the way the Western democracies are governed. And so I'm completely with Richard. We would have no truck with the World Economic Forum. And if we ever had the privilege of forming a government, we would not send any ministers to the World Economic Forum. Right. Right. Because, of course, it's sort of probably, I imagine, almost as old as civilization itself, <laughs> or as old as, let's say, as old as democracy itself, that elected officials and big business will in some way have some sort of connection with each other. You know, it's not illegal to go to lunch with people, for example. But then there's, as you say, what's going on at Davos, which seems to me orders of magnitude more sinister than people having lunch, right? It, uh, well, the, the, there's, I mean, there's the some, business... sort of nexus, some sort of nefarious nexus going on there. Am I going too there has far to be in your a... estimation by saying something like that? No, no, I think it's, I think it's awful what goes on at Davos. They, to the extent that, I mean, the government needs to know what business is thinking. It needs to be in touch with the city and with manufacturing sector, with the high tech sector, with the fintech sector. It needs to know how these sectors are moving in order to be able to govern us properly. But there should be form, formalized methods of communication trade bodies making formal representations of the government on policy. That's all fine. But I've got a real issue with big money meeting big power behind closed doors, which is what the World Economic Forum is. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.